everyone and welcome to the Trade and Economic Development Forum. I am Dr. Rebecca Gokul. I am an economist at the UWI and I also work with the Trade and Economic Development Unit. This evening's conversation will focus <laughs> This evening's conversation will focus on a report that was published by the World Bank over the last week, and it speaks directly to a resilience type disposition for economies of the Caribbean. We are going to be discussing the extent to which the suggestions and the conversations around it are applicable to the TNT case. Dr. Tawari is going to be our host for this session, but before I hand over to him to introduce us to the panel of guests that we have this evening, I would like to remind you to keep your mics muted and to let you know as well that this conversation is being live streamed on our YouTube page. So at this time, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Tawari. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining in. This is an important conversation that we're going to have this evening, and uh, we will see how it goes. We have a very able group of panelists, and uh, the panelists are Professor John Agard, who will speak first. Um, uh, Dr. Scobie from the Institute of International Relations and Dr. Roger Hussein. My name is Botiwari and what I will do today is simply allow the speakers to present and following that, have a conversation and respond to questions and allow you to engage as part of the audience in the discussion. So our first presentation is by Professor John Agard. He will be the main uh, pre presenter today. Um, and he will talk for about 20 or 25 minutes. Um, the Professor Egard is a very, very distinguished academic uh, among us from the University of the West Indies. He is co-author of a soon to be published um, piece of work, significant work that he is doing for the United Nations. He has been an, a very, very active person in the COP26 uh, conference and all the issues leading up to that. And he has also played a major role in university research, as well as in contributions to national and regional development in Trinidad and Tobago. Two of the very important things that he has worked on in terms of regional research are work on the uh, Caribbean Sea, the ocean around us uh, in the Caribbean, which he did some years ago a significant piece of work and pioneering piece of work. And he has also, if I remember correctly, done some work on the uh, mounting, mountains of the region as well. And I think given all the work that he, is, he has done, I think he's come to a point in his own life where he would like to see things happen in the society in a way and with a speed that it has not happened before. So without further ado, I ask Professor Agard 
if he would begin the discussion this evening. Okay, th thank, thank you for handing over to me. I'm going to take a top level approach. Um, you know, I'm involved in sustainable development. That's a big issue. Um, so I will, I will just start off by, you know, taking that top level view and um, I'm going to leave some other issues to, to, to the other speakers who will get down into depth with regard to economics and other issues. So um, this 360 degree sustainable development report for developing resilience, um, and let me just say that is the ability to recover quickly, for example, from COVID-19 or, and climate change. Those are unfolding issues um, where in the case of Trinidad and Tobago, everything has changed. And we hope that when Trinidad and Tobago gets past COVID-19, they, they don't forget the lessons that they learned. And the climate change is a big issue as well. Um, you know. So um, when the 17 sustainable development goals um, were discussed in the UN, Many countries said that 17 S sustainable development goals are too much uh, and can't be achieved. So they should be reduced to five or six. After the debate in the UN, there was a consensus that that was the life that they wanted for each person on the planet. So they approved the 17 sustainable development goals. So I'm just going to go through a little bit of a list as a reminder and make some side comments about um, where Trinidad and Tobago is at. Um, so let me just state the 17 sustainable goals are first, number one, no poverty. However, in Trinidad and Tobago, there are homeless people living on the streets. Okay. Um, so this is some, an issue that needs to be dealt with. Number two is zero hunger, but there are people starving in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Number three is good health and well-being. And COVID-19 has made things worse than normal um, with regard to health. And, and, and the new terminology now is comorbidities. Um, you, you know, yesterday from COVID, um, 31 people died. And, and, and all you're hearing now is comorbidities. They had hypertension, diabetes, yeah, et cetera, and so forth. So the health issue is not going well. And then number four is quality education. But of course, you'll see in the news all the time that there are numerous complaints and battles between teaching face-to-face -face versus online teaching. That's not unfolding well. And you will see in, even in schools, um, you know, there have been COVID-19 cases that have shut down things as well. So that's not going well. Lot of lot of complaints. And then number five, critical, gender equality. And, and with this issue, major issue, there are numerous complaints and battles between uh, you know, this issue of gender equality, where in Trinidad and Tobago, the majority of parliament is male and not representative of the population, which is mainly female. Um, even though the majority of the population uh, are with educated persons with degrees and so on are female. So, so you know, um, this is a major issue about the gender equality. Um, you know, so, and number six was clean water and sanitation. And all I could say is wasser, um, a disaster, not financially stable. Uh, in fact, okay. Um, so uh, and number seven was affordable and clean energy. So the country needs to come up with a plan to promote renewable energy and, um, you know, uh, and, and an energy transition plan because they were relying on, on oil and gas, okay? And they would have to go in the direction of even the energy companies have said the major energy companies in Trinidad yeah. have said that is energy they sell and they see where the world is heading. So they're going to make that energy from uh, renewables, solar panels and all of that sort of stuff. And 
and, and windmills and so forth. And they'll still be selling you the energy. It's not oil and gas is, is what they um, do. That's a convenience at the moment. Um, so the country needs to, to, to think in that way as well. Um, and then number eight, SDG was decent work and economic growth. And that in the current situation has been inhibited by COVID-19. It's a major issue. Uh, many people are out of work, okay? And economic growth ha has been prohibited. So um, number nine was industry innovation and inf infrastructure. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago is still dependent on the oil and gas revenue as the main foreign exchange source, rather than pushing innovation and entrepreneurship and creating new businesses. And I know, um, you know, Dr. Hussein was going to talk more about that. It's a major issue. Uh, and I will mention to you some of what had been said um, be before. And then um, number 10 was reduced inequalities. And my goodness, in Trinidad and Tobago, there's still racial divisions, African, Indian, white, Venezuelan, and nobody wants to talk about these issues, okay? But these are major issues that need to be dealt with, uh, you know, to treat people equally. Um, so, so, you know, uh, the number 11 was sustainable cities and communities. But many in, in cities and communities protest on, you'll see in the news all, all the time, potholes, flooding, even in a country that has the best asphalt in the world, as the Pitch Lake. But, you know, our roads are not up to standard, uh, in fact, not sustainable, uh, you know, and so forth. And protests virtually in the news every night. Um, and then number 12 was responsible consumption and production. So the psychology is if you have money, right, then you, you, you can consume more. Um, but you shouldn't overconsume. That's a personal decision. Um, and then number 13 was climate action. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, let me just state to you, there was a study done by the um, Inter-American Development Bank in which they saw that Trinidad and Tobago, because of the climate change and the heat, is edging into the hurricane zone. And Trinidad and Tobago, um, you know, could lose years of GDP in a matter of hours because they have heavy infrastructure, rigs offshore, you know, platforms. They have point leases where they have huge companies in which um, destruction could take place. So the disaster management and the policy with regard to that, um, you know, is something that we, we lacking in, not building to the right standards and so forth. The World Bank report even mentioned some of that, uh, building to the right standards. Um, you know, um, so, so hu huge issues to deal with. And then number SDG number 14 was uh, life below water. So we need to protect the, the marine environment and develop a, a, a blue economy because islands have more ocean than land. We have more water than land, uh, in fact. And um, we need to exploit that ocean space in a sustainable way, um, not pollute it and so forth. And then number 15 was life on land um, and where we need to protect biodiversity and agriculture, not cut down all of the forests and build houses in them and so forth and put in concrete. That's a major issue of itself as well. Uh, and then number 16 was peace, justice and strong institutions. And this is the part where the good governance comes in. So I'm hoping that Dr. Scobie will talk about that. You know, the need for good governance is a big issue in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, you know, and I will talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, and then number 17, the final one is partnership for the goals. So let me just say that everyone does not have all of the skills and so it's necessary to work as a team, okay, with other persons who have other skills and, and so forth, rather than work on your, on your own. So these are some of the underlying issues um, in Trinidad and Tobago has to face and come up with solutions. 
and policies and approaches and take action, not just talk about it. So in these sustainable development goals, there's nothing really that we can complain about. The question is related to the action that needs to be taken to achieve all of these sustainable development goals in the localized Trinidad and Tobago context. Um, so I, I'm going to select a few SDGs to talk about um, and leave the other speakers, as I keep repeating, to expand on some of the, based on their own expertise. The, so in Trinidad and Tobago, as you know, Trinidad and Tobago produced a Vision 2030 document based on the Sustainable Development Goals. So they've clustered Sustainable Development Goals. And it outlines in that report the main challenges which Trinidad and Tobago faces. And it says they are expanding exports and increasing foreign exchange earnings and employment. Yes, expanding exports and increasing foreign ex earnings and employment, um, solving and preventing crime. You see there's a, a crimes a lot, murders, uh, gender violence and so forth. Um, the next one was reversing the non-progressive values, attitudes and behaviors, such as low productivity and poor work ethos is what it states. And yes, um, uh, you know, part of the, 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 the logo in Trinidad and Tobago is God is a Trini. You know, nothing will happen here. Um, this is absurd, really and truly. Um, and then undertaking constitutional and institutional reforms a very difficult issue when we have um, a government and an opposition and all they do is fight, okay? Don't act in the best interests of the population. So um, another issue was addressing the impact of alternative, alternative energy sources and lower gas reserves and production in Trinidad and Tobago. So this is one of the things that Trinidad and Tobago needs to get away from of it's over-dependence on oil and gas, okay? Um, so discouraging the culture of dependency and sense of entitlement among the population, a huge cultural issue. Dependency, everything has to be subsidized and so forth, uh, I, you know, um, as an entitlement. Um, otherwise we'll vote you out, okay? That's, that's what the population threatens and ensuring effective and, and efficient public service delivery, a major problem in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, implementation of development interventions and measurement of results and collecting the data. This is something mentioned in World Bank report of the importance of, we can't just talk. We have to be, have key performance indicators so that we could check to see if we're going in the right direction or if things need to be changed. The data is quite important. So those on the technical side are the ones who uh, pursue collecting data to see if we perform it correctly or not. And this is one of the issues in Trinidad and Tobago of not monitoring everything that needs to be monitored to determine whether we're heading in the right direction. And um, another thing mentioned was transforming the existing economic growth model into one that is environmentally friendly while addressing climate change, including reducing greenhouse gas emissions and building resilience in its adverse impacts. And the last one was, and I will talk about that a little bit later because we heard what the prime minister spoke at COP26. Okay, just to repeat, oil and gas is not going to go away any day soon. Um, and then he, there was mention about protecting and sustainable using of environmental resources. So the environment is not a priority in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so let me just mention then that in that Vision 2030 document, it outlines five thematic areas based on clusters of sustainable development goals. And these are, I will mention them quickly. Um, the theme one that Trinidad and Tobago is dealing with, the plan from the government is Putting people first, it says, nurturing our greatest assets. Our greatest assets are the people. And it, it mentions a cluster of sustainable development goals, like no poverty, number one, number two, zero hunger, number three, good health and well-being, number four, quality education, number five, gender equality, 
um, uh, number six, clean water and sanitation, and number 10, reduced inequalities, and, uh, and number 11, sustainable cities and communities. And so that's the theme that the government concentrated on. But we don't have the right policies to make this happen. Um, number Theme number two that was mentioned in Division 20 was delivering good governance and service excellence. Um, they, they mentioned sustainable development goal re, uh, number 10, reduced inequalities, number 11, sustainable cities and communities, number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions, and 17, partnerships for the goals. Um, those, are, those are the themes. And number three, improving productivity to, through quality infrastructure and transportation. And this is something mentioned um, in the World Bank report as well um, about quality infrastructure and transportation. Um, and they mentioned clean, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovative infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities. And then number four, building globally competitive businesses in which they mention uh, SDGs, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure and responsible consumption and production. And then the final theme was number five, placing the environment at the center of social and economic development. Um, and they've mentioned good health and well-being, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, industry innovation and infrastructure. So that's the, that was supposed to be the roadmap, okay? But we're not doing well in any of these areas. And um, there have been some reports about where we are in some of these. And their claim is, which I don't agree with, is that we in a, a, a 100% in alignment with no poverty, 100% in alignment with zero hunger. And I don't agree with that. Um, good health and well being, it states that we are in 78% alignment. Um, the quality education, 86% alignment, and gender equality, 40%. So the gender equality, even the government has regarded as a major failure, 40% alignment with this not going well. Um, clean water and sanitation, they claim 100%. Affordable and clean energy, they claim 100%. I disagree. Decent work and economic development, 78% um, alignment. Industry and innovation, 100%. Reduce inequalities, 40%. So the inequalities are a major issue, the government has noted. Sustainable cities and communities, they claim 86% alignment. Uh, responsible consumption and production, 71% alignment. Climate action, 100%, I disagree. Um, you know, life, life below water, 71%. Life on land, 100%. Peace, justice, and strong institutions, 89%. Partnerships to the goal, 64%. So the government seems to be assessing its own progress, um, you know, based on their key performance indicators. And um, I think um, it's bigging itself up. It's noted some lower indicators and stuff. Um, you know, so we, 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 you know, we'll talk later on about um, what needs to be done to get past this. Um, okay, so the... There are a key issues with regard to um, coming up with uh, policy and action plans um, to deal with, with these issues. Um, and let, let me just talk perhaps in an academic way about um, that World Bank report takes about, talks about a 360 degree approach to resilience in the Caribbean, assessing progress and gaps across all sectors. Those are the language that it uses. Actions to strengthen regional coordination. Um, the state will be key for resilience, especially because of the COVID-19 challenge. That's the language. Areas where strength and collaboration is needed include data gathering and sharing. We mentioned that earlier, the data gathering. Um, digitalizing national data. So we spoke about that. This is one of the things that has come out of the COVID-19 situation. Everything is online, like this meeting. 
integrating regional data management and support, allocating health resources during crises, enforcing building codes. We mentioned this before. Um, you seem to be able to do, there's little enforcement, um, you know, sustainable physical policy reforms with a central oversight committee, um, a central contingency fund for major external shocks, um, coordinated tax incentives. So you need to incentivize people with taxes to do the right thing uh, and you need to enforce the law. Um, so uh, in order to build financial sector resilience and more coordinated stra strategies to attract foreign direct investment and, and tourism it mentions, avoiding a race to the bottom and high physical costs. So that's, that's in that World Bank report stated in a general way for the whole Caribbean. But we have to contextualize that in the Trinidad and Tobago um, context to move forward. So um, uh, le let me just talk about, in maybe in an academic way, um, I'm going to talk about the levers and leverage points, I'm going to call it, to enable transformation for sustainable development in Trinidad and Tobago. So I'm just going to mention what I'm talking and what I'm referring to as a um, levers and leverage points. So first of all, uh, a lever is, is a means of realizing change such as governance approaches. So I think one of the other speakers is going to talk about the governance approaches and interventions and leverage points I'm going to refer to as where to intervene in the social and ecological systems where multiple levers might be applied as appropriate in context. So you don't want to take one thing at a time, but there are some actions in which we could progress with many things at the same time, okay? This is one of the key governance issues. So all of the studies that I have read indicate that there's a nexus of interlinkages with potential positive benefits for multiple objectives. So some of the things mentioned are things like consumption patterns, a fundamental driver of material extraction. Um, if you, I mentioned before that if you have more money, you overconsume, okay? And you, you're driven by a world value, which is that good quality of life is that, you know, you can overconsume and even throw away food when there are people starving. Um, so people have to make decisions, uh, you, 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 you know, to, to, you know, help others as well. Um, so behavior change is one of the other issues, uh, per, which pervades all of the aspects of transformative change. Um, supply change and their management, of also conservation and, and restoration. In Trinidad and Tobago, for example, Trinidad and Tobago, this, T and Tech distributed LED uh, light emitting diode lights, LED lights to customers. So how could households could reduce the electricity bill? Um, Massey, for example, introduced reusable plastic bags to avoid single use plastic bags into, into the waste. Okay, so all of these are the kinds of actions that need to be taken to change human behavior. Um, and the issue of inequalities and inclusiveness are underlying problems. Um, good planning processes help, but power disparities remain an issue. If you know people in authority in Trinidad and Tobago, you could get away with doing wrong things uh, that other persons would be made to account for. It's a, Trinidad and Tobago has part of a culture is who you know, okay? Who you know, um, you could get away with things, no, no enforcement. Uh, you know, higher ups and large structural issues underpin all of the above factors like technology, innovation, investment, education, and knowledge transmission. And the issue of um, governance instruments and approaches are fundamental. You have to incentivize people to do the right things and you have to be a, a adaptive management and you have to enforce the law if people do things that are wrong and nothing happens, they'll do it again, okay? So law enforcement is a big issue in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, I just repeat again, people should be incentivized to do the right thing. 
for example, having a tax reduction for Novat and as you know, key food items, uh, law enforcement for littering, gender violence, people recruit the long things. I repeat, if they get away with it because of no enforcement. So these are some of the underlying issues that the, the society needs to transform itself in. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to, I, I, as, as I start to, to progress now into specific things, um, I'm just going to mention something about um, leverage points towards the sustainable pathways. So um, I'm just going to mention five levers around policy or governance approaches. So people have to embrace different visions of a good life. Um, you know, decoupling consumption and well-being as part of a better life, a better life experience. Um, maybe a better life might be spending more time, more time with family and friends. Okay. Not that you over consume and, and, and so forth. And um, re reducing total material consumption and waste is one of, one of the issues, um, one of the leverage points, because per capita material consumption tends to rise as income rises. When you have more money, okay, um, you, you know, you produce more waste, uh, in fact. Um, you, you know, so. That's a trend that is uh, global. And then I would mention number three, unleash date, latent values of responsibility and widespread action. People have to, on their own, decide what is the proper thing to do, okay? To encourage sustainable behavior. Um, you know, so widespread action where people, that is happening um, where people are, including virtues and principles about doing the right thing and regarding the human relationship involving things such as nature and responsibility and stewardship and care as part of where the country needs to be going. And um, reducing in inequalities is an issue, keeps coming up. Excessive uses of, re of resources or power by vested interests at the expense of others, something that keeps coming up. Um, and then practice justice and inclusion is one of the things of not, in, not, of not leaving out indigenous peoples, for example, um, because indigenous peoples have um, their own values uh, as well. And including in, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have people who were here before, um, you know, Columbus arrived. They were indigenous people and they get regarded, disregarded. Um, very important to get um, their inputs as well. Okay, so, so um, you know, so there are a number of, 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 of things that need to be um, brought into the policy framework. Um, I just summarize incentives and capacity building, teaching people to do the right thing. I'm giving them incentives to do the right thing, to change the behavior. Cooperation across sectors and jurisdictions not acting on your own, preemptive action. Don't wait until the disaster happens, okay? You have to take precautionary measures where you see that things are going in the wrong direction. You have to take preemptive action to change the direction, uh, in fact. And adaptive decision-making for resilience and uncertainty, to be adaptive um, and flexible. And the issue of environmental law, I will mention yet again, and its implementation. Okay, so the, um, the, 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 the governance issues keep coming up over and over about transparency. Um, the issues of economy and finance keep coming up as well as major considerations, the economic part, um, where we in a situation where you know, we have money and there are people starving and all kinds of things. And the issue of in, including individual and collective action. So I'm going to just try and, and wind down now to talk about possibly five things that Trinidad Bego needs to do to increase resilience. Um, so first of all, 
after I heard the Prime Minister speak at COP27, um, and I will say that I had a, um, a pre-meeting with, you know, with CARICOM uh, to talking about the policy that they were going to pursue there. And um, one, of the one of these persons was Stuart Young, okay? Um, who indicated where Trinidad and Tobago was headed. Um, so Trinidad and Tobago, the prime minister stated at COP20, you know, at COP that oil and gas are not going to go away any day soon. Trinidad and Tobago is going to be dependent on oil and gas for a long while. But it has to come up with a plan about carbon dioxide zero emissions. Um, in the same way that even the oil and gas companies in Trinidad and Tobago, the major ones, have stated that they're moving away from oil and gas. It's energy they sell, I repeat it. Okay, and they see where the world is heading, where climate change is a major issue, and they're going to produce the energy from renewable energy, windmills, solar panels, and so forth. And they have set dates by which they're going to exit from the petrochemical sector. And the country needs to do the same. Um, you know, the, so, but the prime minister is saying oil and gas is not going to go away any day soon. And oil and brass brings in about 40% of foreign exchange in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so he said that T -T 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 Trinidad and Tobago has the largest renewable energy project in the Caribbean islands that should, should produce about 10% of the country's energy um, needs in the next few years. Um, that's a major project, uh, in fact. Um, and he also said that the country um, would perhaps by 2030 increase the renewable energy to about 30%. So like other countries, Trinidad and Tobago needs to come up with a roadmap plan of when they will reach to zero carbon dioxide emissions. 2050, 2070, they have to all do this in an organized manner, not in an ad hoc manner, okay? Um, but they haven't come up with a plan. Um, although I'm seeing that UNDP has advertised for a consultant to come up with such a plan. So it seems that the, you know, um, foreign money is coming in to push Trinidad and Tobago in that, that direction. It was in the newspapers. Um, so, so, so we hope that that is one of the things that Trinidad and Tobago does because the climate change is a big issue. Um, this year in Trinidad and Tobago, people have experienced some of the highest temperatures ever recorded in Trinidad and Tobago. And um, the heat index is that even when the temperature gets from 36, going up to 32 plus 40 degrees centigrade, with the humidity, um, it feels you know, like 45, 50 degrees centigrade because of the heat index. You can't perspire. So if you don't have air conditioning, you really can't work outside, uh, in fact. That's our major issue going forward. Um, so another thing is, I try to say this in a diplomatic way, um, funding for idea development to create new business entities is a major issue in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I remember that the Economic Development Advisory Board, EDAB as it was called, had proposed years ago that funding to support business proposals could come consistently rather than relying on the annual budget by using about 20% of the annual interest from the, in, uh, in, interest from the Heritage and Stabilization Fund um, to be invest in selected new innovative business idea proposals in a kind of a shark tank approach. You make your case and we will see if we think it's viable and uh, we will provide some, some money out of the interest from the Heritage and, and, and Stabilization Fund um, to see if we could help you to create a business and then employ other persons. Um, and this will increase globally competitive business who employ people. Um, when that was, when that did not progress, um, the EDAB dissolved. 
um, I, you know, uh, it was run by Terence Farrell, uh, in fact. And, um, you know, there was some put off that the government wasn't pursuing. Um, we're in a situation now where um, we need desperately to create new innovative ideas and business proposals. And we need to have some source of funding to push that and then open companies and operate globally. And this is one of the lessons out of the digitalization. You have to have the global as a market, not just sell in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean uh, as well. So um, EDAP you know, dissolved after um, you know, that proposal was rejected. Um, and let me just mention this thing now, one of the learnings out of COVID-19 is to embrace digitization. So, so everyone doesn't have to travel to work, for example, because many people are working from home now, some days of the week. Um, and, you know, that will decrease traffic on the roads, for example, and carbon dioxide emissions. And, and digitization could also make the marketplace global. So hoping for little bits of progress in this direction, since the government has created a new ministry of digitization. So we hope to get some output and results from there of how they're going to push this digitization. Um, and then I will I'll mention, um, develop a blue economy roadmap. So I repeat, Trinidad and Tobago is an archipelagic state that has more water than land and needs to develop the ocean space in a sustainable way. For example, pushing tourism, fisheries, mangrove carbon sequestration, renewable energy production, um, new product development, such as converting. Um, young people have been able to convert sargassami seaweed into fertilizer um, and also um, some students in UE in the Faculty of Engineering figured out how to convert sargassum into bioplastics. Um, so, and, and others in Barbados have converted sargassum into cosmetics and soaps and stuff like this. So instead of making it a problem, um, take it as a resource and make it into products that you could sell. Um, and let me just, I, I will end this one by telling you that I met in Washington at the IDB. I was chairing a meeting in which um, every country in the Caribbean was represented by a minister, but one was a prime minister and that was Mia Motley. And, and she, she announced that um, Barbados is not a small island developing state, but a big ocean state with more, more than 400 times more water than land. And that's the kind of thinking that we want to change the thinking around, okay? Um, very innovative and stuff like this. Um, so Barbados is pursuing a number of things where you could go to Barbados from England, for example, where it's cold and get a one year visa to, to work online from Barbados where you could go on the beach and you could go on so forth and the hotels filled up, uh, in fact, very innovative idea. And they, they, they got money from the IDB to promote the blue economy um, uh, roadmap, uh, in fact. So, and then I will end off now by um, talking about the good governance issue that keeps coming up over and over again. Um, we have to change the governance model from having a government and an opposition. Uh, I can't say this in any polite way um, because they only criticize each other and have difficulty acting in the best interests of the people. I know that um, others suggested, you know, changing the model where even Lloyd Best, deceased Lloyd Best had proposed proportional representation, but that's not going to happen in Trinidad and Tobago because that requires a constitutional change. Um, uh, and the British model that we inherited is not working for us. Um, in Parliament, there's a, a, a bench on one side, which has the government, and, 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 and Dr. Tawari will know because he was a minister. On the other side, there's a bench of people as well, 
um, the Red House was designed on the British model. And essentially, uh, between the one bench and the other bench, opposition on one side, there are two sword lengths apart. They were deliberately designed on the British model, two sword lengths apart, okay? Um, this is idiotic, okay? Um, the, the, the story of behavior change arises, I'm, I, I can't say this in a nice way, out of our culture that arose out of slavery and indentureship. Um, so let me see if I could see this in a civilized way. When there was a massa, Master will tell you, you don't do any thinking. Just follow my instructions. Me and my own will get all the praise and make all the money. The, the surprise is that when your own people replace Master, they are doing the same thing. Just follow my instructions. That's part of the culture change that's required in Trinidad Tobago, behavior change. It seems that nothing was learned from the colonial period. And there's also an additional problem that came out of indentureship. That is the underlying racial divide that few people want to talk about or will admit. There's an re underlying racial divide. Um, so I'm going to, I think I am out of time. So I'm going to leave it at that. And thanks for listening and um, look forward to the other speakers. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yegard, for your uh, very, very clear, uh, precise, and what can I say, um, simply presented presentation, but a presentation of great depth and breadth. I want to move on now to Michelle Scooby, Dr. Michelle Scooby. Uh, I am sure uh, Dr. Scooby would have followed the COP26 um, uh, sessions for the uh, over a week, nearly two weeks that they had it. And uh, um, would probably have thought through how this might impact on the region. Uh, she is a lady who has worked at the Ministry of Finance. She is also trained legally. She is a lawyer. And uh, um, she is now a lecturer at the Institute of International Relations. And she has recently written a book, I think, on global environmental governance. Um, so I want to ask her if she would now uh, speak to whatever issue she considers appropriate. Uh, she might have her own perspective. She might want to respond uh, to some of the thoughts expressed by uh, Professor Egard, but the floor is yours and the freedom is also yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, um, Chair. Um, good evening to everyone. I'd like to thank Dr. Hussein for me participating in this very interesting uh, set of discussions, I'm sure. 360 resilience, that is the key, yeah? To be able to take uh, Trinidad and Tobago, take the Caribbean from where it is uh, to a more resilient place. And we've seen two major shocks which continue to affect us, climate change, the pandemic, and the challenge is how to get out of this. So I'm gonna share my screen with you. Just confirm if you're seeing the screen. Yes, Dr. Scobie, go ahead. Okay, okay. So, 360 resilience. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dr. Tuari was just mentioning COP26, and Professor Agard as well mentioned it in the context of the SDGs. 
and uh, my my area of focus has always been international law, global environmental governance. And I moved from law to governance when I realized that the challenge often is not what laws are in place, but in actual taking them into practice. Yeah? And so this paper is going to look at the governance of resilience. And over the years, I've done a lot of work on governance in small states. And I particularly come at this uh, with the social science behind governance that often is lacking. I don't know if Professor Agard remembers this, but we had a conversation many years ago when he said, you know, he provides to the policymakers all the science and they still don't use it to make the best decisions. And that's a breach, a gap between governance and resilience. And I come at this looking at this 360 resilience document um, saying that there's a lot of knowledge in there on what needs to be done. But to get from knowledge to implementation, we need the governance. And uh, I would say that this, this paper was more like a 355 resilience than a 360 resilience, because unfortunately, it's, I think, a missing gap in this paper, in, in this document, and often in our implementation of climate change, uh, disaster preparedness, or indeed economic development, uh, the, often the missing piece is governance. And here I distinguish governance from government. And governance I define as all the processes, actors, norms, principles, uh, structures, both private and public sector, from global to local that can influence decision making to achieve the outcomes that we want and really keeping all those strands in place and understanding their roles I think that is something that often we don't often have the time for and it affects it affects us negatively so as 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 Professor Egard said we seem not to have learned from the past and governance enables us to do that to some extent and again I think that although there has been a call in this document, the 360 resilience document, to uh, a call for greater efficiency, the, the, the nuts and bolts about how this is to be carried out, I think is still missing. Going back to the SDGs, this is something that I've been thinking through a lot. And I think this is something that our region and our governments need is to know how to get the good ideas, the, what I call the norms, those principles that we think should govern or should uh, we should apply in the, in the context of the SDGs or in the context of the Vision 2030, as Professor Agard was mentioning, all those elements that we think are good and that should be applied, many of them actually come from global forces, you know, like now we're, we're, we're thinking about when are we going to become carbon neutral? That's a, that's a uh, let's say, a discourse or an argument that's coming from the outside and we are trying to apply it. No? And uh, in this case, funding is being provided for that. But we also have the other set of norms coming up. Yeah. And these are the ones that I point here. I point out below. To get to a national policy, you have that contestation between the global norms, gender, gender equality, um, zero poverty, uh, clean, clean and affordable energy, uh, access to water and sanitation. All of these are good policies and we want them to, to be applied. But then you have things that are blocking them. And often the, the very embedded ways of doing things at the national level uh, sometimes militate and stop that. So what I try to do is to stop and think through what are the governance challenges. And indeed, the problem I think is that often they aren't thought, thought through enough. And this document, as good as it is, deals with the knowledge and it speaks about the implementation, but the gap between the two is somewhat missing. Years ago, I did a, a, a study on climate change governance. And these are three very basic elements setting and prioritizing objective, coordinating policy and its implementation, monitoring analysis and reporting. And it's a circle because each of the elements feeds into the other. And the 360 document speaks to number one, 
and much less to number two and num number three. And if you look at any aspect of government policy, often number one is quite clear and less clear sometimes is number two and number three, coordinating policy and its implementation and monitoring. Because if we know where we're at, we would know what changes we need to make to be able to achieve those goals. So here, this, this, um, this, this slide speaks to um, these six points that I think are needed for improved SDG governance. And quite interestingly, actually, is that, um, is that these, I took these from an analysis of the voluntary um, national reporting yeah, that is done by states to, um, to speak to how they, they deal with the SDGs and to, to the extent to which the SDGs that the Professor Egard mentioned at the beginning actually are part of national policy. So these six points, and I'm going to go through these and I'm going to look at four case studies as a reflection of what the Caribbean is doing when it comes to the SDGs. What, what is important is that the policy, the SDGs are actually applied and looked at from the local perspective. That's adaptability. The second one is coherence and the whole of government implementation. So the extent to which, for example, if we're talking about building resilient infrastructure, the extent to which that spans everything that is done in the government, that coherence in the institutional arrangements is often quite a challenge for developing countries like our own. High level political commitments. So again, Professor Egon mentioned the involvement of the prime minister of Barbados at one of those forums. And that really makes such a big difference. And often the challenge in governance is the lack of political will the lack of the engagement of parliament, all of the Caribbean states have that problem of often the um, opposition isn't properly engaged or fully involved in, in, the, in the way forward. And that is a weakness that we have. And then budgeting. So many times we have good public servants, capable public servants, but they just don't have the budgets. No? They just don't have the budgets to implement the goals that are set on high. No? And, and that budgeting for the SDGs is actually a technical process that has to be developed and we're not there yet. And then participation of stakeholders. And this is something that I found, I mean, all of these points I think would have been good to have been included somewhat in this resilience document and a kind of lacking. So we might end up with the same thing. We have a good knowledge and we want to implement, but this, this is the piece in the middle. This is the, the middle of the sandwich, the participation of stakeholders. And here, it's just as important to equip public servants for the tasks that they need to do as it is to engage civil society and the private sector. Why is the government the one to provide subsidies, by the way? Um, I, have, I have some very strong views on subsidies. I, I wrote a few papers on it and I have also um, been part of teams advising the UN Secretary General on SDG implementation. And uh, why does it have to be government driven? Why, don't, why isn't the private sector more involved in providing for greater resilience? Why, is, uh, why should the government provide for, for a catastrophe? Why isn't it that the private sector and the industry standards are built to ensure that they're resilient to climate change, for example, or to ensure that they provide fair wages, if we look at the SDG relating to labor. So engaging this civil society in the private sector, you know, transparency, what is the private sector doing? Is it doing enough? If it's not doing enough, well, then they need to be called out for it. And we're not there yet. And then last science-based decision-making. And one of the weaknesses in many, many Caribbean countries and our own as well, but if it's any consolation, this is a problem around the world. I've also done a study with some colleagues from other countries on this and SCG governance, resilience governance often lacks data and we can't make decisions in a vacuum. Yeah? So that data also involves the, the Supreme Audit institutions, those institutions that check to see what the government is doing, that check to see how money is being spent and involving these institutions 
in science-based decision-making, they continue to provide feedback. When they tell us how things are going, they provide the feedback, we need to take the next decision. So what I did is that I checked the most four of the voluntary national reports on SDG implementation in four Caribbean states to check to see to the extent to which the governments were even aware of and articulating the importance of these, what I call implementation pathways, these six implementation pathways that I just spoke about. And here you see at a glance, yeah. Um, two or, or in green are areas where the policy and mechanisms according to the government were implemented. In yellow, the ones where they were mentioned, at least the government was aware of it, but they weren't implemented. And then in red, areas where they weren't mentioned at all. It's just like, it's a black box. And it's scary, you know, it's scary because this should have been all green, at least from what the government says it's doing, and that's not the case. So what do we see? The government speak a lot about the adapting global norms to local policies. But we have a, a big gap between that talk and what is actually applied. And there, and, and here you see the attempt in some cases to Im improve on the coherence whole of government approaches. That's something as well that the government's more and more encouraged by international actors to put into place. Participation we see at 50%, i.e. who is implementing the SDGs? 50% of the, of the populations, 50% of the efforts are not there. And that obviously can affect quality and outcomes. Science-based decision making, making at 37%. So how could we govern for the future on climate resilience, on zero carbon emissions without the scientific data, et cetera? And high level political commitments even less. So that cross government, government opposition nexus needs to be strengthened. And here we see the extent to which many of these areas need, need to be strengthened, you know, and it's, it's um, public servants, 8%, uh, civil society, you know, 14%. Uh, so these are all areas in which a lot of, a lot more work has to be done. So my, my presentation sort of called into, into question the extent to which we are really able, we have the governance, architecture in place to achieve the goals and the, the, the direction set out in this 360 document. And yes, Professor Egard said I was going to speak to um, governance. And, uh, and I think that, that we are at a, a stage in, in our development where we have the technical knowledge, we have the scientific knowledge, and we need to take the next step towards a better governance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Scooby, uh, for that insightful presentation and commentary on the 360 report. I want to move on quickly now to uh, Dr. Roger Hussain. Uh, most of you would know Roger because he is often on this uh, particular frequency uh, as head of. TEDU, which uh, sponsors this event, and as a participant in most panels, because in many ways he's the driving force behind uh, these sessions that are held under the aegis of TEDU here at the University of the West Indies. But Roger is perhaps best, better known in the public domain as uh, an economist, a commentator, a public educator, uh, a, a public intellectual uh, who is not afraid to speak his mind on issues having to do with national economy, national development, and the region in which we live. He keeps his focus on the nation, on the region more than anything else, 
although he is very well aware of what is happening around the world and what is happening uh, in trends across the world. So I now give the platform to Dr. Roger Hussein, Senior Lecturer at the University of the West Indies Department of Economics, who will now speak. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Tiwari. Just verifying that you all are hearing me. Yes. yes. Okay, good. So I am not speaking the, the night as the head of TEDU. I, I am speaking as, and I'm happy to talk for Dr. Dr. Gokul for allowing me the space to an opportunity to speak. I'm speaking as a member of a civil society group called the Shaw Foundation that was started in 2011. Um, and that has an interest in the ecological welfare of Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean. Um, having said that, I am an economist that, and, and my participation in the Shaw Foundation is as an economist so I, I would start off quickly by commenting on, on some overlap things between Michelle and, and Professor Egan. So first thing I will do is I would ask both of them um, and put them on warning that they did excellent presentations and I would like them to give my graduate development economics class a guest lecture appropriately and I would be in contact with them in that regard. The second thing is Professor Agard mentioned the blue economy. And I know CDB did some work on the blue economy and I think it's a really, really excellent time, Dr. Tiwari and Professor Agard to do a deep dive piece of research. And I'm seeing Professor Gonzalez on as well. So I'm saying this also for his reflection, a deep dive piece of research on the blue economy in the Caribbean uh, Distinct from what the CDB did, the CDB did piece, I am, for, I am thinking here more of an economic, a trade economic study, because it's fascinating to hear the comment that Professor Agard made up that, that, um, that about Mia, Mia Motley saying that Barbados is a water space, if, if, if I remember correctly, is 400 times that of its land space. That's a fantastic statistic and, and therefore it's comparative advantages in water. And, and, and I would like to see how the economics and the trade economics in particular of that water manifests itself in, 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 in opportunities. He mentioned something with EDAB and the HSF and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. It's going to take a lot of time to talk about that. So I'm just going to just quickly comment on it. If only we had saved all our energy rents. I, I mean, for you to say, Professor Eger, that if we could have used the interest from the HSF to fund, I think you mentioned shark tanks, projects, innovative projects that are born global or with export earning capacity. And I sit in my chair often and I have lengthy debates with people like Professor Gonzalez and Dr. Tiwari and other people about the energy rents. I know it's just academic debate, but I think 95% of my gray hair comes from those debates because it's so frustrating to know that it's all gone. And, and I hope we could devise a formula to save some of what we earn now because the current formula is spent on and borrow some more. So we have negative fiscal deficits until 2027, and my guess it may be until 2032. So it's, it's a good comment you made. I, I, I think we should revitalize the EDAB at this point in time, given the, the convergence of these three, what I will call terrible forces, COVID-19, the climate change, and the homicide situation in Trinidad and Tobago. And I may add a fourth one, the structural situation, in trying to be able to, these are each of these are 
humongous problems. And when they all four come at your economy at one time, you need brain power, you need institutional strength, you probably need an EDAP to help you. And so I agree that using the interest from the HSF makes good, good, good economic sense. It's called sowing the, 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 the non-reproducible capital into reproducible capital. I also liked your comment on, and your mention of these students doing work on, 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 on the CV and converting it into useful products. Again, it's one of our factors of production and, and we should. So having said that, and, and trying to comment briefly on, 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 on some of the things of the previous speakers, Today I speak as a member of civil society, as, as, as I, I, and we as the Adishaw Foundation are on a simple journey to plant, well, it's not so simple, to plant one million fruit trees in Trinidad and Tobago. And we, when Rebecca mentioned to me the 360 document about, I'm guessing about a, one month ago, and then I had a, a, a session with Dr. Tiwari, and I read the document, an important aspect of the document that came out at me was food security and trying to pull some carbon dioxide out of the air while strengthening food security. And one of the things our foundation is on a drive to do is to give out 2 million seedlings in Trinidad and Tobago. And we felt therefore that this 360 degrees document gave us as a foundation and civil society a solid basis upon which to enter the national and regional discussion as a group with solid intentions for the environment and that can link these environmental changes to the trade sector. So I'm not sure, okay, now I'm skipping the introduction. So we, we take a, um, some of the, the findings of the, the 360 degrees resilience document was covered by Professor Agard. And the first one is Caribbean countries have achieved resilience levels that have allowed them to support economic development despite large recurring damages. And the second one is Caribbean economies are not prepared for the new challenges posed by climate change. And within the context of the second one, we think that there is some scope for the inv greater involvement of civil society. Because Michelle mentioned in her discussion that why it must be the government. I am saying, why should it be the private sector only? And I think it should be a combination of these three groups, government, the private sector, and most importantly, civil society. Uh, now, three objectives are to increase government efficiency, empower households and the private sector, and reduce future physical risk. Now, our intervention comes in more at the level of empowering households and the private sector. And we empower households and private sector during the period of this COVID-19 pandemic not merely by cleaning up beaches, but we have gone on a drive to strengthen national food security. So we do a number of in-house activities. We develop resources, we plant seedlings. Sometimes when we are short, we buy seedlings and we go to various households recommended by, to us by community leaders in different parts of the country. And we give out these seedlings and all we ask is for pictures of the seedlings later on so that we could share these pictures with our participatory groups. And so far, we have given out almost 1 million seedlings since the start of COVID-19. We take as much precaution as we could. We are very careful, we are very persistent, and we, we, we are well on the way to give out our 2 million seedlings in Trinidad and Tobago. We go to different parts of the country. So some of the things we do here. Now, the seedling distribution helps to strengthen household food security. And people are actually glad for the seedling. We get thousands of feed, pictures and feedback 
we are running a feedling, a, a seedling, a, a grow your own garden competition. We are trying to rebuild a culture of agriculture at the micro level because we are a small country in terms of land space, not in terms of water space in the Miyamotli sense. And if we could rebuild a micro agriculture subculture of planting, then it could go a long way towards changing uh, the, 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 the food import bill. And of course, there's also the benefit of, of removing some carbon dioxide from the air, as well as reducing the amount of foreign exchange going abroad. We hope to extend the seedling drive, and we have actually started in three areas. We have started a mangrove rehabilitation in, in Labre and, and, and Vesini. We have started to, to plant food, food trees in, 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 in schools and orphanages, home for the socially displaced and private companies. And we really hope to build on that in this coming 2022. The COVID-19 makes everything diff difficult. But uh, Dr. Goku, who is the current president of the Shaw Foundation, is very dynamic and always seeks out ways to open up avenues and opportunities for, for the Shaw Foundation. So we hope that she will continue to do so. And then we have partnered with, with institutions such as CCC to, to introduce grow boxes and other initiatives. And, uh, whilst I'm speaking here, we are open for, to, to new members. So if anyone is interested in joining the Show Foundation, they can send their number to Rebecca Gopul, and we would we, we would we would screen you and add you. Now, the the, the type of efforts that we, we focus on from a tree planting perspective is part of the Global Trillion Tree Initiative. And people like Professor Agard would know a lot about the carbon dioxide implications of planting of one trillion trees. We are hoping to plant 1 million in Trinidad and Tobago. It's a difficult process. It's an expensive process, but we are going at it very brave and we will get there. We are not going to stop until we have planted 1 trillion trees. We also are focusing on sustainable fashion. And I didn't even know what was sustainable fashion until uh, Dr. Gokul pointed it out to me. Uh, the global fashion industry is a large contributor to the climate crisis. And reducing its impact is a necessity like any other. Then I know, and she, 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 she designed a slide. She spoke about the carbon dioxide implication of, of one set of new clothes and shipping and aviation and the benefit of using uh, uh, recycled, not recycled, of, of using secondhand clothes and, and, and spreading it along to necessary households. So this is basically um, some of the things that we do. And you know, our activities fit in well with the Moody's and IMF report. Basically, these two reports came out just after the Caribbean 360 degrees document. And all these three reports, in terms of the Trinidad and Tobago implications, say the same thing. We are in trouble. Losing 20% of GDP per capita within the space of 2015 to 2021 is not trivial. And we therefore need to hold on tightly to our economy as we try to rebuild it. Localize economic development where we start from the bottom up and use as much factors of production that is available on the floor through the participation of civil society supported where possible by the private sector and government is the way I think part of the restructuring and redesigning of the Trinidad and Tobago economy has to go. We hope at some point in time within 2022 to marry the social aspects of the Shaw Foundation with some of the work of the university and write a book on uh, how it is civil society could contribute to the resilience of the Trinidad and Tobago economy and Caribbean economy. And we hope that people like Michelle, Dr. Tiwari, Professor Gonzalez, and Professor Egar could contribute. So I would stop here. I, uh, as I said, my presentation tonight was, was of a different type. And I thank you and I look forward to the questions. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. And thank you all who have been uh, listening and taking in the presentations. Um, what I will do at this point is to um, perhaps make, make a couple of points um, very simply and very quickly. Uh, I, 
I mean, one of the issues that has come up from all three speakers is the issue of knowledge. We have the knowledge. We ha also have a lot of reports. Uh, Dr. Hussein talked about that. And there are many more reports that we can mention, including reports that have been actually developed in Trinidad and Tobago over in the last couple of years. One of them, for instance, is the roadmap report. So we have the reports, we have the knowledge, we have the information. Uh, we have the analysis, the explanation of almost everything. And we might well ask ourselves, what is the problem? And uh, a lot of times I can't help but think that it comes down to what to do. Um, that means to say, what are we going to make our priorities for this year, next year, for a five-year period, a 10-year period, as the case might be. Secondly, how to do it, the execution, uh, not only the execution of how to do it, but how to get it done, which is something different, you know. It, it's not just how to do it, it's how to get it done how to not just take the act but to see the thing completed to fruition fruition um the third thing might well be defining the approach you know i think integrated planning is oftentimes missing i see that uh without fearing any argument to the contrary I see it in the problems we have with flooding, with agriculture, with drought, um, and the, the, the fact that we have scarcity of water uh, during certain times of the year. Um, I, so there's very little integrated planning and then collaboration. Um, and mutually supportive execution. Because we don't have integrated planning, we don't have collaborative, mutually supportive execution. And all of this has to be buttressed by good governance in both theory and practice. In other words, we have to know why we are setting up the governance systems that we are and why we need to execute within that realm or framework of governance so that the practice becomes important and value and has value for its own sake. And then uh, I think, I don't know if we pay uh, enough attention. We, when I heard Professor Egard read the performance um, reports based on the SDGs, I mean, I, I couldn't help but think what a joke that is. And I don't think we I don't think we pay enough attention to understand the impact of what we do and how the performance once measured is meaningful to let us know not just what we have achieved, but how much more and how much better or how much differently we have to do it and then the issue of sustaining the impact the objective the results uh, finally the economy the environment the community the intellectual capital and the social capital you know we think economy as if the environment doesn't exist we talk about environment as if you didn't have to have economic development in order to be able to really enjoy that environment and to help to sustain it, you have to pay for it. And then uh, the community, because the sustainable development, what is the sense of development if the community does not advance? And of course, the intellectual capital, you need individuals who can perform at high levels 
and you need this social capital to help the society to cohere. And of course, the sustainability perspective uh, is so fundamental because it is required to make the resilience possible. If you do not have a view of sustainability, resilience will never become an important factor and you will not take it into account in what you do, you know? So I mentioned those things because uh, it's just a commentary on what um, I heard this evening. And I would close with just one short quotation from UNCTAD 2019 report on the digital economy, digital economy report. And it is this because it has to do with the digitalization that Dr. Yeager, Professor Yeager had mentioned. And the quotation is this, the ICT infrastructure has become critical in the functioning of an economy alongside water, electricity and food supply networks, alongside vaccines, reliable connectivity is an essential element of the COVID recovery process. I mention these things because I think it is important to understand that where we are missing the ball is in getting anything done and making any real advance, uh, no matter how much we have actually done and how far we have advanced in certain things. And the final thing is that the fundamental challenge that we face now is that if we cannot get on that digital platform and be able to deploy and harness, harness and deploy your resources in a way that optimizes the value of that to basically connect with and seize opportunities in the real world as we develop a competitive capacity, business capacity, entrepreneurial initiatives, et cetera. I think we are going to miss the ball again. We've missed it many times. So on that note, I want to open the floor for any questions. And I would ask Rebecca's help uh, in making sure that we get the questions and have the panelists answer the questions as they are asked uh, questions. Some of them might ask the question directly to a particular panelist. No problem, Dr. Tiwari. We do have one question that is in the chat and this is directed to Dr. Scobie. The question is as follows. Is there anything we are doing right? Even if we are not yet at the targeted level, how do we compare regionally? Are we ahead or on par or lagging? So I'm just gonna post that out to our panelists in terms of our spaces. I noticed Dr. Gonzalez has his hand up. Dr. Gonzalez, go ahead and unmute your mic and ask the question. And you can direct, direct your query to any one of the panelists. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Rebecca. And um, let me thank um, both presenters, uh, at least the three presenters. I found both, um, all the presentations to be very, very um, enlightening. Uh, my first question is really to Professor Agard. I think he mentioned that we need a transition plan, an energy transition plan, uh, which we have to develop right away. Uh, but I was under the impression that there's already a fair amount of thinking on, on this. I, I saw where Professor Jupiter presented something on the, on the energy transition. I also saw where the, the head of, of NGC, Mr. Lu Kwan, um, he has also presented some ideas on the energy transition. And both of these gentlemen seem to think that um, gas would be a, a transition fuel um, that would take us up to about 2040. In the meantime, we put in place re renewables and we move to electric cars and all of that stuff. 
And we, we also developed some kind of um, um, production of, of, of hydrogen, of, of, of this, this, this kind of uh, green hydrogen, which would in a way be compatible with the, the goals of, 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 of net zero. So I wanted to ask Professor Egard, um, to what extent there's already in place or some thinking along those lines, which he, he tends, to, tends to subscribe to. I will come back afterwards and pose another question to, uh, to Michelle. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we can take one other question. I noticed an individual, um, dear Sami Saravanka Kumar, um, you can unmute your mic and go ahead and direct your question accordingly. Yeah, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, excellent presentation from Prof. Agard and Dr. Scooby, as well as Dr. Roger. And I'm happy to see the initiative of uh, planting 1 million trees, uh, fruit crops. Uh, since um, I'm the lecturer from the Faculty of Food and Agriculture, I'm happy to see that initiative. Um, my question is to uh, Dr. Uh, Roger Hossein, right? Um, that is actually with respect to agriculture, right? And um, its contribution to economy and thus also the potential for its diversification. When it comes to high income countries uh, like Trinidad, it contributes to GDP less than 1%. But when it uh, accounts to money value, it will be around uh, 240 million US uh, dollars. Um, so in that case, um, when we compare it with the low income countries, even if they contribute more percentage to the um, GDP from agricultural sector, but still when we look at the money value, it is low. So in that case, are we, are we undermining uh, the contribution of agriculture um, uh, to the GDP in Trinidad and Tobago? That's uh, my question. And what is his uh, take on this um, contribution? of uh, agriculture sector to GDP in high income countries. And the second one is, um, uh, that question is actually to uh, Prof. Egard. Uh, based on uh, these presentations, is there a need to set uh, the context for sustainable development goals exclusively for small island developing states based on their needs and developments to be undertaken simultaneously? Thank you. On question. Um, so panelists, we've had a group of about four questions. You can take the first round of questions, Professor Agard, um, Dr. Scobie, and Dr. Hossein. Okay, can I respond to Anthony Gonzalez? Sure, um, yes. Okay, so I, I have the, spoken to Professor Jupiter. Um, also the issue of the green hydrogen, which is coming out of Kenji. I've had discussions with, with them and stuff. Um, you know, the person who um, was pushing the green hydrogen in Trinidad and Tobago was actually at COP26. Um, however, their ideas are informal. Um, the government needs to come up with a hard policy. These are just suggestions. Um, uh, Professor Jupiter made his, his ideas available. Uh, they're available, it can be downloaded stuff and, and so forth, but it's not an official government policy. That is really what the problem, the, the, the country needs to come up with a, a problem where they make that energy transition. Um, I know from N NGC, Mark Lucan, because I'm on the National Council for Sustainable Development, uh, which he has just joined as well. So we've discussed all of these things, but they are just informal at the moment. The country needs to have a, a discussion and get inputs from the population and then decide on coming up with a, 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 you know, a, a country policy. Otherwise, um, this would just be old talk, uh, really, because, and then the country has to come up with an implementation plan, rather than we just talking about this academically, and we're not taking the action required to make this happen. So that is what I was uh, referring to, of the need to, to really come up with a solid road plan, 
that is not that the the government speaks to itself. The government has to engage with the private sector and with the community, get ideas and stuff, and decide on the way forward and come up with a plan and um, uh, make that plan available for people to make comments on and revise it and so forth. And, and you know, solidify that into this is now the government policy. So that is what I was referring to of the need to, um, to do that. In view of the current situation with climate change, um, what I had mentioned earlier where the energy companies um, in Trinidad and Tobago had already made a decision that I said is energy that they sell, is not oil and gas. Um, in NGC, they said that, you know, well, gas is, is really um, CNG and stuff like this. So this is a transition um, to moving away to renewables. And they have put all of that in the newspapers and so forth. It's a transition plan. But as I say, those are not official, that's not official government's policy. When, when Dr. Scobie had spoken earlier about governance, this is part of the important aspects of governance, of consultation with the private sector and the population and coming up with a plan and then executing that plan. That's, that's really what I was pushing at. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else that you want to add um, to clarify on that. Thanks very much. So Eka, there's one other question that was directed to you, and it is whether or not there needs to be some kind of um, uh, adjustment of the SDG goals that are targeted specifically to small island development states, so that it, it encompasses an understanding of where those economies are and what it is actually going to take to get to get those goals achieved? Um, yes, so um, when you talk about SDGs, um, the discussion has been at a global level, but they have to be contextualized on a regional and national level. Um, this is one of the things that I spoke about at COP26. Um, uh, you, you know, um, I had had many meetings before um, where small islands went to, to COP26 um, with a policy, which was really, and the ne negotiators with, were the Association of Small Island Developing States, AOSIS as it was called. And um, they came there to fight for money that um, the big countries caused this, the main emitter of carbon dioxide is uh, China, um, then the United States, the European Union, India, and so forth. And they were saying that the commitments made to provide resources to do this. Um, the, you know, haven't provided the money that was promised in the Paris Agreement. So I will, I will leave it at there and allow the other panelists to respond as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Eger. Dr. Scobie? Okay. Hi. Hi. Yes. Thanks. Sorry. Um, so, thanks for the questions, and uh, I'd like to comment on on first the the question from um, Mr. Osborne and uh, uh, wh whether the government is doing anything right. I would like to say that that study that I did was on what the government say they're doing. And it was more to get the temperature of the states of the region on how they saw the development process and the extent to which they were including these key elements of governance and development. So I, th this study in particular went very much into detail on those four states. I have done previous work on Trinidad and Tobago's reality and in all cases, the challenge, the challenge of governance is the same. And uh, I'm not blaming the Trinidad and Tobago government necessarily for that. In fact, and, and this is where sometimes I, I speak more internationally than locally, 
a lot of the funding for government projects, going to net zero, um, gender equality, um, health and climate change, which is becoming a big issue now. A lot of that funding comes from overseas, you know, or maybe from government government budgets, but they don't require that whole of government approach that involves more than just the government, but the private sector, the civil society, etc. So, in short, um, you know, are we are we are we doing what we need to? Are we at the level that we we need to be? I would say not yet. Um, are we are we getting there? I would say the SDG process, and you can actually look at the SDG as a SDGs as a tool to sort of push better governance. I would say that we're definitely more sensitive to some of these issues, and there are let's say attempts in some cases to 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 move the the the, the process forward. I'd like to mention what. Uh, about the about the um, the SDGs and small island developing states. The SDGs were created by all states. It was a 10, 15 year process between the Millennium Development Goals and the development of the SDG goals where everybody got involved, even in, in our region at the local levels, as, um, civil society, etc. So those 17 goals are negotiated goals that apply for the first time, unlike the Millennium Development Goals, which were more to the developing states, this applies to everyone. And the study that I did is that I that I shared with you is how you take the SDGs and you apply them locally. So the first point on adaptability was each each country thinking how do we need to take these seventeen goals? Which ones are more important for us, and what steps are we going to take to put them into into effect? So I think as the, this this forum is an excellent one where we sort of you know think about where we're going think about how these goals are being applied and uh, and that helps government it helps guide government as to the voices that are coming up from the local levels that can contribute towards governance as well okay. thank you very much your question Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Scobie. Um, Dr. Tiwari, if you don't mind, I'm going to, given the time, I know we are just past 8.30. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone post their closing comments. And I know there is an outstanding question for Dr. Hussein, but really on how do we mobilize more of the youth in terms of these types of conversations and these types of initiatives? whether it is targeted to agriculture, whether it's targeted to energy. Um, and that is one of the final questions that was posted in the group. So I'm just going to take a round again um, and I'll ask Dr. Ega, Dr. Scobie, just to include those in your closing comments. And I will allow Dr. Hussein in his closing comments, just to wrap up where we are at for the evening. Dr. Ega? You have to unmute. Um, okay, so the youth are quite critical um, because this is the world that they're going to inherit. So they have to be involved and not um, disregarded that because you're too young, you don't have an opinion or you don't have any experience. Um, and now um, in, the, in, the, in the world that there are new social media tools that can be utilized. And uh, that is part of the leverage points that have to be utilized, where people are on Facebook, now Metaverse, Instagram, and so on. And information could be communicated globally in real time. Uh, in fact, these are very, very powerful. And this has disrupted politics, where the communication line had been dependent on who you know. Now, people, information could be transmitted globally um, in real time, very, very powerful tools. And um, so th that's one of the things that um, I think young people are more adverse to than those who are older. Um, you know, this is what they have grown up in and they can use that to communicate information. And um, we, we now know that those in the political sphere monitor the social media, in fact, to find out what people are thinking. And this modifies 
the approach that uh, they are using. So um, youth are quite critical. As I say, repeat, this is the world that they are going to inherit. And um, hopefully if they have all the information, um, they, they, when they get into power, will be able to do better. So I'll, ha I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dr. Agard. Um, Dr. Scobie? Thank you. I agree with Dr. Agard that, you know, you are absolutely critical. I want to point to three ways in which the youth can be involved. Uh, whether they're, as, as uh, Bradley Osborne said, unemployed or underemployed, they can contribute in consultation. And both the private sector and the governments of our region can do better in creating forums where the youth can actively be involved in shaping policy. You know, the renewable policy of the region, to what extent are youth uh, involved and capable of contributing, you know, made capable of contributing, empowered. The other one is implementing policy. A lot of countries have discovered that it's actually cheaper if you get the civil society involved in implementing policy. Instead of the government paying for it all out of its own pocket, let the people with the expertise contribute. And finally, monitoring and reporting. So I have a little story about what happened in Haiti. Governments would donate money to Haiti to build hospitals, etc. And unfortunately, sometimes that money didn't find its way into the hospital building. And, uh, and so one of the things that was done is that um, people were given incentives to use their cell phone to take pictures. And there was this young person that took a picture of the empty field where a brand new hospital that there were pictures of its taken was sent to this foreign donor, except there was no hospital, you know, the money went somewhere else. And the, the, the youth have that capacity to monitor and report and comment and be whistleblowers, et cetera. We all can, but especially the young people. And therefore they can contribute to help us to see where things are going as planned and where we need to take stock and make a change. So that's consultation, implementation and monitoring. And just like to say that, you know, the SDGs, it's a process, you know, and everyone should be involved in it. And that process of getting everyone involved in it is the government's process that we, we have to work on. And probably with the civil society, groups like this, think tanks, putting more pressure can provide that forum for great involvement of everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scobie. Dr. Hossain? Okay, thanks. So I, I'll be brief. In response to Louis Sami, um, agricultural employment in the last 15 years in this country was halved. So that even if the tree planting exercise helps to supplement in some basic way that remained in employment and helps to boost overall agricultural output, um, that would benefit the economy. I, I, I didn't fully grasp your question, but uh, what I did understand, that is my response. And in terms of the comment by Bradley Osborne, um, Republic Bank Limited recently emphasized that it will be giving out more green support funding. So maybe that's a place that a young person could start. It may be favored. Even Netco, I think, may be more inclined now in the context of, 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 of the economy to support these green funding type of activities. And as Michelle said, join a good civil society group. You see, a good civil society group would help you to get involved from the bottom up and have a better contextualized understanding of the problems from the floor. I call it localized economic development. So that you could use your learnings there to help trigger change and transformation. I understand the, the concern that young people would have though in the context of a 20% fall in real per capita GDP, it's, it's frightening. And apart from the young people specifically, where people like, 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 like Dr. Tiwari and Professor Egard and the rest of us come in, is we have to keep pushing the government to, to, to change the relationship between transfers and subsidies and capital expenditure, where you spend 28 million or there are billion or there are about on transfers and subsidies and 4 billion on capital injections that could widen supply side space and create jobs for people like you all. 
to probably about 20 billion, 8 billion, or 20 billion, 9 billion, somewhere in that vicinity. And we, 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 we would just have to keep going out there. And as Professor Agard said, right at the start of the conversation, sometimes even in, 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 in the best undiplomatic way you can, you know, make your point clean, clear, honest, and direct, and hope that you could get it across to the policymakers to create more opportunities for the young people in Chan Tobago. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussein. Dr. Tiwari, do you have any closing comments? No, I would I would just say thanks to everybody, Professor Agard, uh, Dr. Scobie, Dr. Hussein, for their really sterling contributions here tonight, and to the participants who asked questions. That was an important part of the contribution and the evolution of the discussion. And to you um, for um, your organization of these events in such a significant and workable way. Um, always successful every time that you do it. I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. I thought it was a marvelous session and thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Please be safe. Good night, everyone. Thank you.